Five cents might not seem like much, but when it's five cents for every cow every day, then it really adds up. New AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine provides the optimal combination of cost, feed stability, rumen stability, and intestinal release to deliver the best cost per unit of available methionine on the market today. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash findyourx. Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing for Balchem, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. We have a very intriguing topic today, and we look forward to a lot of great questions as we move ahead. Today's Real Science webinar is titled, Understanding the Impact of Daily Rhythms on Milk and Component Yield. This topic is an extension of a webinar we completed several months ago, where we looked at how the cow reacts to seasonal variations in light and temperature. We're pleased to welcome back Dr. Kevin Harvatine from Penn State University for a look at how daily rhythms impact the cow. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Kevin Harvatine. Kevin is currently a professor of nutritional physiology at Penn State University. He earned his PhD and postdoctorate from Cornell University. Dr. Harvatine's research integrates traditional ruminant nutrition and modern molecular bio, uh, biology approaches to investigate the regulation of metabolism and develop dietary intervention strategies to improve dairy production. His specific research uh, objective includes investigating dietary factors that modify ruminal fatty acid biohydrogenation, regulation of synthesis of milk components, and basic regulation of lipid synthesis with a goal of developing feeding strategies to improve the efficiency and performance of dairy cows. Dr. Harvatine, the floor is now yours. Thank you for the introduction, Scott. Thank you for, for having me back. Uh, I'm really excited to be here to talk about one of one of my favorite favorite subjects and, and to be speaking on this platform. I've really uh, I loved watching all the seminars and the podcasts uh, that Balchem has been putting out over the, the last year. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit of backstory on, on how I came to this, this work with daily rhythms. And this really uh, goes all the way back to, I, I was raised in a tie stall barn, so a small dairy in, in Pennsylvania, and we component fed. Now I'm not gonna advocate component feeding. It's not the, a great way to feed cows. Um, but it is a really great way to start thinking about what's going on in the rumen. So when we were component feeding, it was all about sequencing the feeds. And you would feed your long hay and then some corn silage and grain and then try to get more long hay into them before you got more grain in, right? So that, that, that's what started this thinking about what's entering the rumen and how that's impacting the rumen. Because in component feeding, if you get things wrong, you can really, uh, mess up the room and, and you and you can especially mess up mess up milk fat. And then in my master's, I was working with Mike Allen and Mike Allen had a feed observation system. So we were actually measuring feed intake and really thinking about what was happening across the day. And we were taking a lot of blood samples at high frequency to actually understand how the feeding behavior was linking to absorption of nutrients and their stimulation of, of different hormones. And then kind of leading into my PhD, I was reading some of the basic literature. And right around that time in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, they made some of the key discoveries about regulation of circadian rhythms. So when I got to Penn State 12 years ago, my expertise then was, was really in milk fat. All my work was fat supplements in, in milk fat. And I decided I needed to do something new, kind of start a novel area. And I thought this is a really great area that could work in that we have the new discoveries and regulation of these basic rhythms. We have all this, this um, demonstrate importance of the pattern of feed intake. So I wanted to put that, that all together. So hopefully I can give you a little bit of a sneak peek into what we've done over the past uh, 12 years in, in this area. Let's see, okay. So I want to start out a little bit different and give you the principles that I hope I will convince you of today. The first is that there's a daily or circadian pattern of feed intake that creates large changes in rumen fermentation across the day. 
also show that there's a daily pattern of milk synthesis. I think we anyone who's milked a cow uh, appreciates that, that morning milking is different than evening milking, but we always just look at daily averages and daily totals. But let's we're going to start thinking about what's happening within the day. And then hopefully convince you that maximizing efficiency requires synchronizing nutrient absorption in mammary needs, and that considering daily patterns provides opportunities to optimize the rumen and milk production. So a, a, a lot of my work focuses around milk fat, but we can extend that out to, to milk protein also, because basically fat and protein are, are what farmers are being paid for on, on the farm. So we have nutritional factors that are impacting these components and non-nutritional factors. Today, we're really gonna be focusing on this time of day as far as the mammary glands capacity to make fat and protein, but then also the effect of this time of day has on feeding, uh, feed intake in that cow. This ties in with feeding strategies because we can modify this feeding pattern across the day. And I don't have it highlighted, but I also think there's some important links to the protein side that a, a part of this uh, regulation of milk protein synthesis is through insulin signaling in energy substrates. And we can really change the peaks of those across the day, depending on how we're feeding, feeding that cow. So let's talk about these circadian or daily rhythms. I don't really make a big distinguishment between what's a circadian rhythm and what's a daily rhythm, but we probably should, should take a, a minute to talk about that. So in a daily rhythm is just anything that's changing across the day. And it could be changing for any number of, of reasons. A circadian rhythm is something that changes across the day, but it's regulated within the animal and it's a true repeating cycle. So the difference is that if you, um, I, I always like to use the analogy, if you go down in the basement and you lock yourself in a dark room and you have all the food in there that you need to eat, you will get tired tonight, you'll go to bed and you'll wake up in the morning and you'll be active during the day. You'll be hungry at about the same times as you normally eat. And then you go go to bed and you'll keep up that daily pattern for a long period of time. And that's because what you have is a true circadian rhythm that is a clock in your brain that's driving those. So to demonstrate circadian rhythms, what we have to do is put an animal under constant conditions. So constant darkness, constant food availability, no external signals. Well, that's really hard to do in the dairy cow where we have to be providing fresh feed every day and we have to be milking that cow in a certain interval, right? Uh, so, so in the purest sense, there's a difference that circadian rhythm is driven within the animal. A daily rhythm is just something that's occurring each day that, that may be from an, an external source like the pattern nutrient absorption. But for, I think, our discussion, it, it, it becomes a little bit academic in, in, in distinguishing those two. Many, or not, we could say most biological functions follow a 24 hour pattern. So activity and alertness, nutrient metabolism, milk synthesis and intake are the two we're gonna talk about today. So why do we have these? Well, they allow the animal to anticipate changes and adapt before they occur. So they're very, very uh, helpful for survival. And we'll actually find circadian rhythms all the way from bacteria to, to humans. Uh, so basically all living organisms have some version of a circadian rhythm. And that's because it's very, very helpful to know that, hey, I'm going to have lunch in another two hours and I should start preparing my metabolism to digest and absorb and utilize that lunch rather than thinking that I have no idea when I'm going to eat. Maybe it's going to be a couple more days, right? Uh, so these are very helpful for that animal to prepare and, and be ready. So I also want to mention that, remember, we talk about daily intake and production and not saying we shouldn't. Those, those, that's an important uh, summation of the cows, uh, the, the cow lives second to second and minute to minute. So feed is consumed through meals across the day. Our daily intake is simply the number of meals times the size of the meals. And our cows are eating five to 12 meals per day. Milk is synthesized continuously across the day. So if we actually think about how we change feed intake, we have to change number and size of meals. If we wanna change milk synthesis, we have to change capacity at some moment in time 
across the day, um, that that's the biological, biologically important spot, right? So we have to think beyond just this daily total. So these bi biological rhythms are repeating cycles. They're driven by timekeeping mechanisms in the animal. So this is actually a clock running in the brain. It can be reset. We call that entrained by external factors. So timing and lighting would be an example of that. And just quickly showing how, how we normally characterize these rhythms. We have a period, which is how long it's occurring. So our circadian rhythms are 24 hours. The last uh, um, seminar I gave for the series was on seasonal rhythms. So there, our rhythms were actually uh, uh, 12 months between our peaks. We have amplitude, which is the height of that rhythm, and then we have the timing, which is also called the acrophase. So this is going to be maintained if the animals put under constant conditions. Again, they're helpful because they allow that animal to anticipate changes before they occur. So how does the cow know what time of day it is? Well, we have this master clock that's in the brain, and it's keeping track of external cues light dark is the major major signal that's setting the brain and this has been well described for 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 a long time you know over 50 years we've known about the the master clock in the brain what was discovered a little bit over 20 years ago it, are these peripheral clocks and these peripheral clocks are basically timekeeping mechanisms that are in each tissue of the body They've mostly been studied in the liver and adipose tissue and other animals, uh, but we're starting to look at them in the mammary gland. What's interesting is these peripheral clocks are entrained by other cues. Normally, they're synchronized to the brain through endocrine signals, but they can also be responsive to things like timing of feeding, and they seem to be much more responsive to timing of feeding compared to the central clock. Uh, so we have light dark being important, but feeding time is also demonstrated to be very important. And I would argue that milking time is also very physiologically important in the cow's life, probably is also a big thing there. A breakdown in the daily system creates jet lag. And anyone who's flown across the world or stayed up all night trying to get a project done or with a crying baby appreciates the next day, you don't feel so hot, right? Um, and that's your circadian system is thrown off. Well, part of it's the rest, but also your circadian system's thrown off and it needs to adjust again. What's very well demonstrated is the disconnect between lighting and feeding can cause metabolic issues in humans and rodents. So example, this is night shift work in humans is simply bad for you. It increases the occurrence of just about every disease all the way from psychiatric disorders and metabolic diseases and obesity to uh, breast cancer. In animals, they're able to show that by uh, disconnecting time and feeding from the lighting, they're able to induce obesity in diabetes and mouse models. So it's very important, very well demonstrated that we have multiple rhythms in the body and that these rhythms being in synchrony is very important for health. So we came up with this idea that we have to synchronize the timing of nutrient intake and the timing of milk synthesis. And we have this illustration shown here. So we're showing that we have one uh, rhythm that's the milk rhythm in the solid line, and then we have a nutrient rhythm. And in a perfect world, they would be synchronized, but they may not be entirely synchronized. And if they're dis in dyssynchrony, what we have is that at some points of the day, we have more nutrients than the mammary glands able to make use of, and those nutrients are lost, just put in adipose tissue. But then there'd be other times today where the mammary had more capacity to make milk than what we're providing it groceries to do, right? So now we have lost capacity because we're not using all the enzymes and all that metabolic capacity that the cow has. So hopefully the cow knows what she's doing and she's able to align her pattern of intake with this pattern of nutrient need by the mammary gland, and she's taking care of this, right? But there may be things in management based on the timing of feeding or how we're managing that cow that is causing a dyssynchrony. And then that would be very, very bad to have this, this dyssynchrony occur. So I talked about this in our seasonal but I work, but I wanted to, to mention this again, that we have a long history of photoperiod or lighting having an impact on milk synthesis. So this is data going all the way back to the late 70s. It's been well replicated that constant long days, 16 to 18 hours of light versus eight to 10 hours of light increases milk yield five to 
They got an additional effect of short days during the dry period. And what's really important for our circadian discussion today is that this is eliminated by constant light. So in constant light, the rhythm will stay for a certain period of time, but then the amplitude diminishes. And then the animal actually get, becomes what we call free running. And that's because the, the internal signal is not 24 hours, it's 24.2 hours or something. Yeah. So then the animal is no longer synchronized with other activities during the day and, and things kind of get, get, get confused. So it's really interesting that this increased milk yield with long days is eliminated by, by our constant light. <clears throat> so the basic mechanism of photoperiod is this, through the same signaling as circadian rhythms. And the circadian rhythms are also the same cues that our seasonal rhythms are being driven off of too. So we have sort of uh, one regulatory system that's driving multiple, multiple outcomes. There's some interesting work out of Purdue uh, looking at phase shifting or phase disruption during the dry period. So the experimental design that's shown here is their control cows have, have normal dark at night, light during the day. And then what they did is they actually created jet lag. So what they did is that they had the dark period shift by six hours per day. So this would be the equivalent of flying six time zones every single day. So these eight cows are in constant jet lag. So when they did this, they've had some variation in their responses. They had reduced milk yield by the phase shifting in a 2014 paper. They had decreased blood glucose and increased milk yield in a 2020 paper. And then a recent paper showed increased insulin, reduced memory development, and uh, milk yield in our, the last paper in 2020. So, you know, I, I think we still have to work some things out here, and, and it's a little bit confusing why they would have increased milk yield in one and decreased milk yield in two. But what I would say is it's demonstrating that there is an impact, at the very least, an impact on metabolism, an impact on memory development and capacity for milk synthesis. What I'm guessing is that some of this variation would have to do with interaction with other signals. So we could, maybe it's an interaction with, um, seasonal rhythms, depending on what time of year these were done. It could be an interaction with milking times or, or just other factors that are coming into play. Uh, I, I'm not so scared about the variation. It is demonstrating that there, there is an impact of, of having this disrupted rhythm. So let's talk about our, our daily patterns of intake. I always like to start with this pasture data coming out of New Zealand. Uh, and I, I want to kind of take the, uh, the, the a moment to have us recognize that cows were not always in barns with TMR available all the time, right? So cows would have originally been out in the wild, uh, living on their own. And there was selection pressures that were applied there that are still, uh, still with our cows today, right? So cows are prey. They... Uh, there, there's things that hunted them. So their feeding patterns are going to be impacted by that they were looking to eat when it was safer to eat during the day. Um, and also during the day when photosynthesis has been running, there's higher sugar and higher amino acids in that forages. So there's an advantage to that cow eating during the day, resting in a safe place and ruminating at, at night. So I, in our, even in our pasture managed dairies, we're, we're not quite exactly in that, that natural world, but it's, it's a little bit closer. And what I like about this data too, is that they're seasonal calving. So you notice that sunset that's being shown in the, the dotted line uh, to the right is shifting during the year. So when we look at this, cows are not eating much feed at night. It's not they don't need anything. It's just they're not eating so much at night. They come into milk, they go out, they're getting fresh grass and they're hungry because they've been away from feed. They're eating, they're eating during the afternoon and the evening when the sun goes down, the cow is saying, it's no longer safe for me. I should go find a place to, a safe place to rest, digest, ruminate, right? So very rapidly drops intake. And then they kind of have this, this midnight snack that they're eating a little bit more around around midnight. So this is a really kind of consistent pattern that's been observed in the literature 
over over many years that they that we have kind of this natural pattern of, of feed intake so what happens when we put cows in a in a freestall barn well this a lot of this was very well characterized by trevor DeVries going all the way back to his phd work so this is data from um, tmr fed cows they're feeding two times a day in the the black line four times a day in the gray line and the two times a day is coming at the two big peaks. So the after milking in the morning and before milking in the evening. And then the four times a day is to include where they're offering the additional feed. Uh, you very clearly can see from this in TMR fed cows, feed delivery is a very strong stimulus. Cows also eat when they return from milking because they've been away from feed. Um, and there's also, uh, when you empty the mammary gland, there's going to be a stimulation of milk synthesis. So they're probably also hungrier from that increased uh, nutrient use for, for milk synthesis. So we are also seeing higher intake during the day, uh, lower intake at night. Uh, I should mention that, that there's always a little bit of discussion around push-ups, feed push-ups. And feed push-ups are very important, especially when feed is not within reach. But feed push-up is not the same as fresh feed delivery. That is very clear from the literature. Fresh feed delivery is much stronger than, than, than feed push-up. Uh, eating and ruminating tend to be inverse. So we have some very talented cows that can make a lot of milk, but they cannot eat and ruminate at the same time, right? Kind of mutually exclusive, exclusive things. So if we look at back at this grazing data, the cows are eating a lot more during the day that left less time for rumination during the night when they weren't eating as much they had much more time for rumination so ruminating uh, uh, tends to be higher at night dur than during the day and just to show another uh, data set on this this is they're looking at rumination across the day during different levels of heat stress so this is low medium and high uh, THI and you can see they still had almost a doubling of rumination at night compared to during the day. Uh, so we talked in my last, last seminar about, about heat stress in, in night feeding. I, I think that cows, this daily pattern is really strong and cows uh, have a hard time breaking, breaking out of it. So we really have a quite consistent daily pattern to, to rumination. We'll talk more about this coming up, but remember rumination is also really important for buffering in the rumen. So this causes a big shift in our um, um, rumen pH. Okay, so we have a feed observation system at Penn State that was modeled after, off of part of Mike Allen's system. So the feed tubs are, are hanging from a load monitor and we're uh, uh, recording feed weight every 10 seconds on our, our computer. Uh, much better than, than having to shovel feed at, at hourly intervals and we're not disrupting, disrupting cows, right? So I want to just show you control TMR from, from one of our experiments to, to kind of talk through this. And this is really consistent um, uh, feeding patterns that we see in our data when we're feeding cows well, once per day in, in the morning. So showing dry matter intake, uh, and this is in two hour intervals across the day and starch intake on the right. Is this the normal TMR? So starch intake is, is the same as our TMR intake. So over, comparing intake during the day versus the overnight, we have three to fourfold higher intake at, during the day than we do at, at night. And what I think we've kind of uh, had ourselves lulled into a little bit is this false idea that when we feed a TMR, since every bite theoretically is the same, that we have a constant entry of fermentable feed into the rumen. And it is true that outside of sorting, uh, every bite is the same, but if that cow is eating four times more per day, that is four times more starch entering the rumen during the day. So this is where the concept of TMRs really fall apart in our quest to create constant rumen fermentation. Now, I'm not going to say constant rumen fermentation is what we want. Uh, we want to, I think we want to stabilize rumen fermentation to a certain extent, but perfectly constant probably would not, not be ideal. Uh, so this daily pattern of intake, this high intake after feeding and high intake in the afternoon uh, drives a big dynamic in the amount of starch and amount of nutrients entering the rumen over the day. Uh, so we also got some data from some experiments out of Mike Allen's lab to look at how consistent this daily pattern was. 
So we had an experiment where we changed NDF uh, concentration and NDF digestibility starch level and digestibility, and then also fat, fatty acid profile. And we saw really consistently within that data, uh, some of these experiments he's feeding later in the day, and that creates a really big, uh, uh, a really large amount of feed being consumed after feed delivery. But in general, we see large amount of intake after feed delivery and a uh, large amount of intake during the afternoon period, uh, less feed intake during the overnight. So it seems to be very well conserved across different diet types. Okay, so what's the impact of daily pattern of intake? So intake is entrance of fermentable feed into the rumen. Fermentable feed is uh, causes synthesis of VFAs and also microbial protein. VFAs are acid load for the rumen, but they're also nutrient supply for, for the cow. So in that experiment where I showed you the, the control TMR, we also did rumen evacuation three times over the day. Um, and we're showing that on the right, dry matter pool is on the top and starch pool is at the bottom. If we look at that starch pool, it's almost a threefold difference in the starch pool across the day. And that's because since starch is digested so rapidly in the overnight when cows are not eating very much, it gets depleted. And then when they're eating a lot, it gets increased again. Not going to show the data, but there, there also is a change in microbial populations across the day. And there's some data to, to, to point to, to there being a dynamic in the enzymatic capacity for fermentation across the day. So in the morning, when those rumen bugs have not been getting much starch during the overnight period, the amyloidic capacity, the capacity to break down starch is actually lower because that microbial population is smaller and less active. During the high intake period of the day, uh, we, the, that population is bigger, producing more enzyme, you have more capacity for starch digestion. Uh, this does cause a problem for doing like in vitro and starch digestibility, there's a lot of variation in that in, in vitro assay. And part of that is that, that starch digestion capacity is so dynamic across the day that, that the rumen digested that they're using it, is different across the day. Okay, so we mentioned rumen pH, that during the overnight, cows are ruminating more, not getting as much starch, rumen pH goes up, peaks before feeding, and then drops down over the day. And then uh, on the bottom corner, just wanted to quickly mention ammonia. So really important to maximizing our nitrogen efficiency. We have almost a doubling of ammonia from the overnight period to the high intake period of the day. Uh, basically, you have all of that soluble protein entering the rumen during the high intake period of the day. And to a certain point, that's okay to have more of it because we have more starch, more fermentation occurring, but we can't utilize all of it. So, so this is the, 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 the concept of synchrony of that carbohydrate and protein sources coming into play. And part of this is not just having it uh, synchronized, but then also thinking about that pattern of, of intake across the day. There's also a pattern of rumen methane. So this is data from Jersey cows fed once per day or two times per day. And you can see there's actually a doubling of methane production, rate of methane production across the day. Overnight period, less fermentation occurring uh, versus that afternoon period. And then there's very little data looking at duodenal flow. But I know from just sampling duodenal contents that at night, it's really a lot harder to get a sample than during the day that the cow is just, just less active. Very difficult to do this with marker systems, but just wanted to show uh, solid phase and liquid phase markers in one experiment that they had. They were seeing a, a pretty significant dynamic in the amount of digestive flowing to the duodenum. Uh, and then also looking at the crude protein content in the lower right-hand corner, that there is a big dynamic in the crude protein content. In this experiment back in 1999, they were actually feeding a protein meal at midnight trying to um, uh, kind of shift that protein uh, absorption across, across the day. But again, just wanted to want us to realize rumen's not constant, rumen outflow's not constant. And this changes plasma uh, nutrients and our endocrine hormones. So this is data from Oba and Allen where they took blood samples every 20 minutes across the day. And you can see a dynamic to blood glucose and plasma insulin. This is when they're feeding high and low starch diets. It's also an effect of diets that that high starch, highly fermentable feed 
causes more of a dynamic in, in these, these systems. So we wanted to know how flexible the daily pattern was. So we did an experiment where we fed cows once per day in the morning or the evening or 50-50. And the biggest thing we saw here is that if you look at AM versus PM feeding in the two hours after feeding, when we fed at night, cows ate 50% more in that two hour block after feeding. Even the cows fed 50-50, they're eating 50% more in the evening than they were in the morning. You look in the overnight, they actually go down to low period of intake and that blue line, the cows fed at night, we're actually waiting till the afternoon to increase their intake. Now, the, the, out, but it's about 50% higher rate of intake at in the afternoon or over 50% higher than at night when that feed was 16 hours old. So I used to think that cows ate during the afternoon because that's when they had fresh feed and fresh feed must taste better, right? But this really demonstrated to me that cows are eating during the afternoon because that's when they're naturally active, that's when they're hungrier based on these natural rhythms. And it's kind of hard to break cows out of that. This night feeding, I really worry about because that cow is hungry, she just gorges herself and then she goes, goes to bed. And this has kind of messed up a couple of our experiments where we we're trying to shift patterns across, across the day. This, uh, in this experiment, we got a huge increase in insulin after feeding in, in uh, the evening when they had eaten that big slug of, slug of feed. So let's move on to talking about milk synthesis. So, so very few places in the literature do we report milk composition and yield by milking. So this is one paper out of Wisconsin in 2008 that they looked over five days in commercial herds and they saw highest milk yield at the morning milking, lowest milk yield at the evening milking, but they had lower milk fat in the middle line at the morning milking, higher milk fat in the evening milking. And you have to look close, but there's also a pattern to milk protein percent as you go across those, those days. They also saw this in three time a day herd, if milk herds, and I don't think this is a surprise to anyone. This is why we always have to sample all milkings when we're doing experiments, right? But we really have never looked at interactions. So when we have a treatment effect, When's it occurring? Is it at one milking more than the other milking? So this is coming back to our idea of, of the synchrony. So our first test of this synchrony is that we fed cows one time per day, or we fed cows in four equal meals across the day. And we milked cows four times per day. My grad students joke that circadian experiments are a good way to mess up grad student circadian rhythms because we have to do a lot of sampling, uh, a lot of extra work. But you can see we have a daily pattern of milk yield and it's different between the, the two feeding regimens only at the last milking. Looking at milk fat percent and milk protein percent on the right hand side, we see a pattern to both across the day. And, and we shr shrunk the amplitude by feeding four times per day. We actually had higher milk fat at all milkings. We reduced milk fat depression a little bit by feeding four times per day in this experiment. But we also shrunk the, the difference between the lowest and highest milk fat percent by about 50%. So we, we interpreted this to say that, that there is a circadian pattern to milk and milk component synthesis, and it's at least partially dependent on the timing of nutrient absorption. Next, we wanted to see if we could shift these rhythms. So to do this, we fed cows during the day or night. So this is, uh, I think there's seven hours that the cows were without feed. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side that, that we were able to shift the timing of, of intake across the day by, by, reduced, by not having feed available for that seven-hour period. We had to be a little bit careful because I did not want to um, have feed not available for too long and reduce intakes and throw off milk production. You can see that those cows that were without feed during the day, when they got feed at night, they were, they were extra hungry and ate more than the cows that were fed in, in the morning. So then we milked four times per day and we looked at these rhythms of milk yield, fat concentration, protein concentration. And you can see that we shifted the timing of the rhythms now. We have the rhythm, but we're shifting the timing of the peak. Um, uh, it depended and it's lining up to the shift of, of when that feed is available. So now we're demonstrating that not only can we change the amplitude by evening out feed intake, but we can shift the timing of the rhythm 
by when they're consuming, consuming that feed. Uh, plasma glucose and insulin concentrations were also shifted um, uh, as you would expect by that timing of nutrient intake. What's really interesting is that body temperature is, is pretty much driven by the clock in the brain. And the clock in the brain is really hard to shift by the timing of feeding. Normally it stays on the lighting schedule and, it, and it's not responsive to the timing of feed intake. But we did see in this experiment and actually in a number of other experiments where we shift the timing of feeding, that we're able to shift the, the daily rhythm of, of body temperature. So this is an indication that in the dairy cow, it may, that the central rhythm, that whole body rhythm is being driven by the brain, may be more responsive to the timing of feeding than it is in some of the other animal models. Uh, so I, I mentioned that, that our peripheral tissues have these biological clocks. Um, and, and I didn't show the molecular mechanism to this, but basically there's a, a, a series of genes that regulate each other's expression, and they end up with this 24.2 hour, hour rhythm. And we call these the core biological clock proteins. So we want to, to look at if, if we were shifting the actual core clock, because up to this point, what I've shown you is that we've changed the rhythm of milk synthesis, but this may just be simply because of substrate that the mammary gland was able to utilize those extra nutrients that are available at a certain time of day, and that was shifting the amount of milk that was being produced. So to demonstrate that this is actually at the level of that clock keeping mechanism, we took biopsies at four times over the day uh, when we either were feeding control or in a night restricted feeding. And we did see some shifts in the timing of these core clock genes. Now this isn't the perfect data that I would have drawn out to want the perfect graph, but it is enough data to be able to point to, to say that by changing the time of feeding, we are shifting the timing of the core clock within the mammary gland. This experiment's much easier to do in mice, and we've, we've done that with day feeding versus night feeding, and we see a perfect inversion of the mammary clock, and this is after only four days of day versus night feeding in the mouse. So it is clear that the timing of feeding is able to entrain this basic timekeeping mechanism within the mammary gland, which is actually, actually to me, pretty cool that we can understand it to, the, to, to that, that point. So kind of bring this back a little bit more applied, when, when do cows prefer to be milked? I don't know, and it's really hard to answer that question, but I think we can kind of look at some data from uh, robots to look at that. So this is an older robot experiment. You have to be careful because these robots can be overrun with cows and they're being used all the time. They, be, they can be shut down for part of the day for cleaning. Uh, but it's interesting to look at this data where you know, lowest incidence of cows coming to the parlor was in that early morning period. And this kind of makes sense if you think about that cow would be that, that developed being nursed by a calf. And when was that calf most active and wanting to nurse? Well, the, the coldest part of the day is right before dawn, right? So that calf is, is not going to be getting up and being active before the sun comes up, right? So when the sun comes up and then the calf becomes active, it's going to be nursing more. And that's probably why we have more milk being produced during the morning, that calf's active, nursing at a higher rate. Later in the day, the calf is not nursing as often, but needs more nutrients so we would have higher fat concentration. So just wanna throw that out there that it's interesting to think about this from the cow's perspective. So how can we use this information? Think not just about the diet we're feeding, but how we feed it and how the cows are eating it. We need to watch the cows and see what they're doing. I think we first need to think of the rumen. Can we stabilize the amount of fermentable feed entering the rumen over the day? Again, I don't think it needs to be constant, but I think we need sort of an in-between where it's a little bit more consistent. Can we take some of the slugs out and fill in during some of the low points? How do we do this? Feed delivery is the strongest sim si signal we have, uh, and we can use that to increase intake during low intake periods of the day. So early in the morning and around noontime or lower intake periods of the day, afternoon is naturally high. Um, my uh, I like making this recommendation, make sure feed's available from when cows return from the parlor. 
but I like the idea of delivering feed two to three hours before or after milking. And this may spread intake across the day, stabilize the rumen. Um, a paper out of Trevor DeVries King uh, et al. in 2018 uh, demonstrated this with shifting uh, feeding to three hours from, from milking time. What else can we do? Uh, we've thought about feeding different diets across the day. Uh, I still like this idea and I think we could make it work, but I don't have the answer yet. Uh, so I think it would be interesting to think that we could feed the same ration to the entire herd in the morning when we're just trying to get feed out and we could return and we could give top offs to certain groups. Um, I think everybody thinks that this has to be more complicated, but with the technology we have on farms, I think we could actually um, uh, eat, do this and in, in not make it more, more complicated. I just wanted to show one example of what we tried in doing this. So we had three different dots. We had a control TMR, and then we had a high fiber and a low fiber TMR, which you should call them partial mixed rations. When we mixed 70% of the high and 30% of the low, we had the same nutrients as the control. So then we have three treatments. We fed the control TMR once per day at 9 a.m., we had a high low where we fed 70% of the feed as the high fiber diet is 9 a.m. 30% of the feed is a low fiber diet at 10 p.m. This is what I thought was gonna be the better treatment because we had lower starch diet during the high intake period of the day, higher starch intake during the low intake period of the day and during the overnight. And then what I thought was gonna be the worst treatment was feeding the low fiber high starch diet first and then the high fiber diet after that. But what we, we did see some interesting things. The HL um, actually decreased intake, um, numerically decreased milk yield a little bit. Um, uh, it depends how you, how you think about that, but we did lose some milk fat yield in that treatment. So the HL actually turned out from a production standpoint, not to be, as, not to be the better treatment. LH, um, Numerical decrease in dry matter intake, numerical increase in milk yield, no change in, in milk fat and protein yield. So what, what happened with this experiment? I didn't have time to show you all the data, but basically what happened is that when we came in at 10 o'clock at night and we fed the low starch diet, the cow stood up and ate just about all of it. Slug ate that, went to bed, didn't eat anything in the overnight period. When we fed that starch at night, she was pretty full. She had high amylytic capacity and she ate so fast that we actually created a worse condition in the rumen. So what I did not take into account is the behavior aspect that by feeding at night, we were influencing the behavior of that cow. Uh, the, the LH feeding that high starch diet first actually turned out not to be as much of a problem. I think because rumen starch concentration is so low, you can feed more starch, but yet rumen starch doesn't come up too high. Also, amyloid capacity is lower at that time point. So it's actually a period of the day where you could sneak in a little bit of extra starch and you're sort of almost priming that rumen. Now we'll say we came back and we tried to do this feeding steam flake corn first and we pushed it too far and we ended up with a little bit of milk fat depression by feeding that starch first. So I don't have the right recommendations, uh, but I think there is potential there. And what I would like to just say is, is that we've learned it's complicated. We have to be careful with the effective timing, timing of feed delivery that changes feeding behavior but it does demonstrate that we don't have to feed the same TMR across the day. I don't think we should keep ourselves handcuffed into saying there's only one way to feed a TMR and we have to feed just one diet the whole, the whole day. There may be some times that we could take advantage of. Uh, quickly, an interesting call from the field. One pen of cows at a large farm consistently lower in milk fat. They moved some cows and they went up in milk fat. Normal milk fat depression, uh, troubleshooting, didn't turn up anything. The cows were being fed later in the day. We switched milking and feeding orders, so feed delivered earlier and before milking, milk fat increased equal to the, the pure pen. So, you know, I can't say this is exactly what, what did it, uh, but I think it's really important to think about that when we, especially in large dairies, we have cows being milked and fed at all different times a day. And we have to think about what that means for their daily life and how that's affected.
recruitment. So this wrap this up, we have to think about left dark cycle, we'll talk about that more in the seasonal rhythm time, but that's playing in here also. Milking time, feeding time, this is impacting that rhythm of the mammary gland. It's impacting the rhythm of milk synthesis or rhythm of, of intake and nutrient absorption that all impacts our capacity and rate of milk synthesis. So our key principles, there's a daily rhythm, of intake has major impact on the rumen, daily pattern of milk synthesis. Need to manage that daily pattern of intake. Our best tool is through feeding and milking schedules. Don't be afraid to feed multiple diets per day, but be careful with late afternoon and early evening feedings. Um, uh, early morning might be, might be the safer option. Have to recognize that the folks that, that have done the hard work in the lab, a, a lot of this work was um, the mammary gland work was done by Isaac Sulfur during his, his PhD. Have to recognize our funding sources, especially uh, USDA has funded two different grants on daily rhythms um, for us. Th thank you for your time and, and uh, hopefully we have a few minutes here to be able to answer some questions. We sure do. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And before we get started answering questions, uh, we'd like to share a brief video and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. At Balchem Animal Nutrition and Health, we strive every day to deliver results you can see in your animal's productivity and your bottom line. From a smooth transition into the milking string for your fresh cows, to a happy welcome home from your furry friend. From a strong start in your poultry flock, to consistent weight gains for your finishing hogs. We expect to earn your business and your trust with our people, our products, and our science. Our people have an intense passion for your animals and your success. You can count on us for honest, candid advice and practical solutions for your toughest challenges. As the global leader in choline production, chelation, and encapsulation technology, we take our obligation to you and to the environment seriously. Our products are backed by the most extensive and thorough research portfolio, while our business is committed to advancing environmental sustainability and animal welfare. In the end, it all comes down to results. Balchem delivers real results you can count on, results that exceed your expectations, and results that bring true value to your bottom line. Leading the charge to meet the nutritional needs of ruminants, monogastrics, and companion animals, Balchem offers a growing portfolio of nutritional products and a dedication to innovation and industry sustainability. Balchem is here to solve today and shape tomorrow. All right. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Uh, Kevin, to get us started, our first question is, um, and I think I think this was covered uh, during the presentation, but it. Uh, you know, repetition is the mother of understanding, so it doesn't hurt to, to go over it again. Are, are there some ideal times uh, of day to feed different supplements? Great, great question. Um, for, on, the, on the supplement side, I, I think there's really good potential that there's times a day that a supplement uh, would work better than other times a day. And we don't, we don't have the data on that. But I think you could think of, say, um, like a, a live yeast, where you're saying that the oxygen scavenging is a key part of the mechanism and in a rumen fermentation stability uh, mechanism, you, you would want more of that during that high intake period of the day, right? Um, for some things that we're trying to increase rumen bypass, there might be a time of day where they would have a faster transit through the rumen and thus we would have higher rumen bypass values. We, we don't have the data on, on that, uh, but I certainly think that there's more than enough biology there to support that, that there would be a time of day where, where one supplement could have a benefit more than, a, than another time of day. Okay, uh, and kind of related to that, um, Matt would like to know, does the timing of nutrient supplementation in the feed affect the rhythms observed? 
so uh, I mean, most of our work on shifting the rhythms has been on um, timing of uh, feed intake. We I didn't show the data, but we've done some more basic work looking at alumacil infusion of protein and fat in 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 um, uh, acetate at different times a day. We we're trying to track down if it was just just if it was a specific nutrient that was that was driving these. And, and we kind of struck out there to identify just one, that they all shifted, um, they all had an impact in their own way. Uh, so it doesn't seem like it's a, a specific nutrient, like it's not, it's not just protein and it's probably not just one amino acid that's, that's driving that. Um, you know, I, I think that it, it's probably that there's redundant mechanisms and that, that it's sensing intake of a lot of nutrients, not just one specific one. Okay, we're getting a, a few questions on feeding at night. Let's go with uh, Dr. Hutchins' question. It says, please review uh, feed lower energy diets at night. What percent in each time period, assuming labor is not a problem? Yeah, so I've kind of moved away from this a little bit that what I would be careful of is I, I don't like night feeding, and I, I don't like feeding so much that I, I've kind of given up on that idea of having a separate diet during the, the overnight period. To get that in there, you would have to change that diet at your last feed delivery. So I think where our bigger potential is, is to modify that first diet and to get that first diet out earlier, like before milking in the morning. And then be coming back with that second diet, and and um, I really don't like having uh, additional additional diets after the, after the, uh, say six o'clock. The the one thing that I didn't really get to talk about very much, but I think that's really important, is we also have to th consider rest in cows, right? And um, that night feeding. So we, we stimulated that slug eating, but if we start feeding too many times a day, we can also start impeding on that cow's resting time. And I know going back to in the component feeding days when there's data going on on feeding grain multiple times per day, at some point feeding grain more times per day wasn't helpful. And it was because you were disrupting that cow's others, other behaviors that you know, she was laying down and ruminating. Now you're coming through with feed and she's getting up and, and you're breaking that up. Um, so there's, there's some really great data, not, uh, you know, a lot of great data from Minor Institute and Rick Grant. And then there's some more recent data where they actually were, were not letting cows rest. That demonstrates that resting is very important. So we kind of have to balance balance those two. So I, I guess I don't really have a number to throw out there on how much to make those different. I think you can get a little bit more starch in that morning delivery. Just be careful to not make it too fermentable. When we when we went in, we pushed it too far using steam flake corn and, and we were using like um, I think it was six pounds of steam flake corn at that first feed delivery. And I and I think the amount of starch would be okay, but um, the amount plus the fermentability caused the issue. All right, thank you. And I'll stand with that theme. I've got a question from Marcos uh, in Latin America. He says, uh, it's common in Latin America to feed close-up cows in the evening. Do you think that this may have a negative effect? Uh, specifically yeah, so well, I know in the beef world, uh, I forget what the timing is, but I believe if you feed them at night, they'll calve during the day at a higher frequency. Um, so that that might be what they're what they're trying to to do. So you know the the the, the close up cows, um, I would not want to be feeding them at midnight, right? But if if it was just in that early evening period and they're on a low starch diet, uh, that is not that's that would not worry me so much. Uh, where where I think it's a problem is when we're feeding these higher starch diets. And in lactating cows, they have such a big drive to, to consume feed. All right, thank you. Um, Carrie is asking, is the milk rhythm simply from a change in nutrient supply for milk synthesis? 
so we, we can't rule out that part of it is, is the nutrient rhythm, right? Uh, but with our biopsies looking at the core clock genes, we, in, in the mouse, it's very clear that that timing of intake totally inverted those rhythms. But we did see enough of a change in the, the, the core clock genes in the cow that I think we can say we are changing that core clock. Um, so we really have two things going on. We have the core clock that's driving the enzymatic capacity of the enzymes. But then we also have the nutrients that the enzymes are using, right? Um, so I, I don't want to say that the amount of nutrients available is not having an impact. I'm, I, I'm sure that it does. But then there's also the impact of the enzymatic capacity, and that's being driven by that core clock. All right. You uh, discussed um, the importance of, you know, putting fresh feed in uh, front of the cows. Do you have to mix fresh feed for each feed delivery? Yeah, that's it's really it's interesting to, to think about. It. So we did all of our experiments in, in tie stalls. And uh, when we went into this, we were really worried about like if when we fed one cow, we randomized our treatments, right? So there'd be one cow in a morning feeding in the stall next to a cow on a PM feeding, right? So we worried about just activity in the barn stimulating one cow over the other. We worried about if we would have to, to mix, mix fresh feed. Um, in some of our experiments, we, we did mix fresh feed just so that we, we took that factor out of it, right? Because we, we wanted it to be as, as similar between those treatments as we could. But it, it, I don't think it's about the fresh feed. I think it's the stimulation of uh, feed being delivered to, to the bunk. And when you look at our cows, like they learn their, their uh, feeding times. So that cow that was fed at night, when you fed the cow in the morning, there's no change in intake in that cow at night. There's not even a blip there really. Um, so that cow really learns when her feed is coming and it's really hard, hard to trick her. Uh, so I, if you're mixing one batch of feed, I think you can put half of that out, leave the other half in, in the mixer. Um, probably don't leave it out in the sun during the summer, right? Get it under shade. But then you can come back and deliver that, and that's going to be fresh feed to those cows. And I think that's going to be a strong stimulus to, to get them to come. We have not tried this, but on smaller farms, um, I think it would also be interesting just taking a five-gallon bucket of feed down through a pen. And, and I'm guessing you probably could stimulate a reasonable amount of feed intake just with that small amount of grain being sprinkled over. All right, great. Uh, Gene would like to know, should we limit the number of feedings per day with robot TMR feeders? Should we restrict the time of day that feed can be delivered? Yeah, so I have not done any robot work myself, but it, I think there's big application for this in our robot feeders. Um, if you think about a robot, it's really component feeding to a certain extent, right? We have a partial mixed ration and then our grain. So it's not complete component feeding, but you're feeding a substantial amount of grain in slugs in the robot. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things to, to think through there. Um, that grain is is a big part of the drive for that cow to come to the robot. And, and you're using grain to really manage that feeding system as much as you are to, to, to manage the milking system as much as you are to manage the, the nutrition, right? Um, I, I think that there would be probably more of a potential to change the type of grain that's being fed. Um, so we talked about feeding that high starch diet at night and in, in creating that stimulation in, of intake by coming to, through the barn feeding with feed delivery. In the robot, we could do that very easily just switching from say a, a, a higher starch diet that we would feed at night to a diet that was lower in starch and higher in fermentable fiber uh, during the day. Uh, in the cow, we wouldn't have as much of a stimulation of changes in behavior. Now, maybe cows would learn what time of day is the feed that they prefer, uh, but I think there'd be a lot of potential for us to to modify not just the amount, but the composition of the grain 
that's going in in that robot. And and I like I said, I haven't done robot work, but I'd almost want to play with composition more than amount because I know that amount is is such a big part of managing the the cow flow. All right, thank you for that. Uh, I see uh, that we're at the top of the hour. Got time for one more question. Um, what do you see some of the largest unanswered questions uh, related to uh, daily rhythms and feeding? And where do you see your research or others' research going forward? Yeah, so so kind of the flow that we took is that that our first experiments were around the feeding behavior in the rumen side, and then we switched and we we focused on the mammary gland. And now I think where we're at is we really need to uh, come back and kind of link the two together and start and do some more uh, applied feeding experiments. Uh, we just talked about the robot. I, I think that's a big place where we need to do, do more work. Um, I, I think it probably is the place that has the easiest application um, on farms with, with this. But, um, yeah, I, I think we, I think we 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 need to circle back again to that applied applied part. And like I said, I I still believe that we can feed different rations across the day and have something better than a single TMR, um, but we don't have the right answer there. And I I really would like to to work out the details of that. And 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 it, just to kind of mention there, I think we have to give credit to the cow and how adaptable she is. Um, and she can make a single TMR work pretty well. Um, and she really does does that in, in a number of different ways. But I think we could probably work with her a little bit and learn from her pattern of intake to try to try to match a little bit better. Well, thank you, Kevin, uh, for this insightful uh, webinar. I uh, really enjoyed it. And I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll forward them along with the unanswered questions from today's session. The next Real Science Lecture webinar will be on August 3rd when Dr. Paul Kononoff from the University of Nebraska will share Feeding the Metabolic Race Car, a discussion on the use of starch and fat as fuels. Our next monogastric webinar will be on August 10th when Dr. Uh, Jenna Wilson from the University of Georgia will discuss what's new in broiler breeder management. And finally, watch for details on the upcoming unveiling of the new Dairy NRC. We'll have a series of five webinars featuring a review of specific segments of the new Dairy NRC. These webinars will take place in early September, so watch for more announcements uh, coming very soon. Visit balchemanh.com slash real science for more details and to register. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. We now have 19 episodes out on YouTube, your favorite podcast platform, and also at balchemanh.com slash podcast. We go behind the scenes to hear the conversations that take place uh, over a few drinks with friends. Search for Real Science Exchange on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to follow us. Don't forget to request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash podcast. On behalf of Balchem and Dr. Harvatine, thank you for joining us today. Thank you.